Benchmark, the voice of business. Presented by LMD. On this edition of Benchmark, Dr. Ruanti De Silva, a director and CEO of SCM Plus Hong Kong, joins us in the studio today to discuss leadership in a man's world. Then, we talk to Shaheen Kader, managing director of Nielsen, about the BCI making marginal headway in June. And we wrap up with LMD columnist Deshal Dimel, who gives us his views on Sri Lanka's macro outlook. That's the lineup for Benchmark. Hello and welcome to the Big Picture Business Program Benchmark. I'm Savitri Rodrigo. Today we take a closer look at leadership in a man's world. And with me is Dr. Ruanti De Silva to give her expert views on the subject. And Ruanti has worked in the maritime industry for over three decades. And she's been involved in agency shipping, in freight forwarding, uh, chartering, liner shipping and ship management. Ruanti, lovely to have you with us on Benchmark. But just as... Uh, sort of a startup to our interview today. Um, what does the leadership landscape look like at present? Thank you, Savitri. And I think that's a very interesting question because to begin with, the leadership landscape itself, I do not think can be defined in just one scale. Once again, leadership per se is defined also by many people in different ways. In my mind, if we go with the general norm of what leadership is perceived to be in the world, locally and internationally, I think it's uh, the corporate or board sittings or top management or even in governance or government, the number of women versus men sitting at that level. If I was to go on that definition, it's so unfortunate to say that in general, on average, what I understand from whatever magazine I read, whatever statistics I see, is there's nothing more than 12% max of women in these positions. But when you go up further, like to the real top board level, it is nothing more than a 4% of women. But if you break it down now further into industries, it can be much worse. The industry I come from, which is maritime, it is disastrous because a woman is not recognized to be even capable of being there. Do you think there's an ideal style of leadership? Well, I do not think so. Because Savitri, for me, leadership does not mean being at a particular designation, a managing director or a group director or CEO or to be a minister or even a prime minister. That's not for me the definition of real leadership. Leadership for me is something much more deeper and something much more stronger and at the same time something more subtle. Leadership is where I think people who look at you accept your beliefs, accept your values. They believe that you are doing the right thing and they want to follow you by virtue of the fact that you are in their subconscious mind getting them to accept and believe in you not just forced follow in terms of your power and position that is what I call power playing so I do not think that there is a recipe or a standard or a norm as to what leadership should be once again. It depends on the setting. Whether we like it or not, we live and work in a male bastion. So do you believe that fraternal organizations are here to stay, that we have to live and work with it? Or is it something that is receding as we go along? Well, once again, I believe that it's up to us women to make ourselves known, seen and to put our presence and our opinion and our way of doing things and how we feel about things, most importantly, our principles and our values known to this male fraternity. I do not think that we should accept that we are anything inferior or that we are the weaker sex. So for me, 
I think it be begins with self. If you do not have confidence in yourself, if you do not believe in yourself, how would others believe in you or have confidence in you? So I feel that that characteristic should come from your upbringing. And especially mothers, mothers should instill in daughters that you are worthy. That's what my mother did. And uh, we did not have any feeling of bias or inferiority against uh, male siblings or male uh, friends. No. So it's up to us to make uh, that statement. How can organizations uh, recognize and better deal with gender discriminatory practices at work? I think it's, as I said, up to the woman to, you know, be seen. Women, I have noticed, always automatically take a back seat. They should not do that. And organizations should believe that they are eliminating 50% of potential in the world if they do that. And women always have this flair. It's not a, you know, feminine mystique uh, ingredient they carry, but it's more, I think, an acquired, um, uh, acquired characteristic in a woman to multitask. You would be carrying a baby and you would be making a soup whilst you are also attending to your husband or mother at the same time doing your accounts, even in a household situation. Whereas I find men, they will focus on one thing, they may do it great, but they are not as multitasked as women. So I think men, whether they are in a corporate boardroom or not, should recognize this, that women are able to contribute provided, of course, they do contribute and they're serious about the job and understand that women are a very important component even though there will be negativities in terms of, for example, maternity leave or child sickness leave because they should understand that that motherhood, that motherliness is what nurtures our next generation of youth. We take a short break now, Ruanthi. And when we come back, we're going to continue our discussion with Dr. Ruanta De Silva on leadership in a man's world. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. We can show you a world Shining, shimmering, splendid Amazing, beautiful, dazzling, wondrous space for you and me. A whole new world. The future's got a whole new world for you. The most advanced technology now on multiple smart devices for total convenience. Welcome to HB New World Banking. Welcome back to Benchmark. We now continue our very interesting discussion with Dr. Ruanthi De Silva on leadership in a man's world. You know, you mentioned the maritime industry, even the engineering field, and even the legal field, where there are a lot of lawyers, but when it comes to the top or actual practice in court, there are no women or very few, a dismal number. What is it? Um, how can actually women be encouraged to break the mold, go out there, because I'm sure they're as capable as any of their male counterparts. But why don't they go out there and break the mold, break the ceiling and just get on with it? I can only blame we women for getting into that groove. 
we should begin to realize that it begins with us. Breaking this norm begins with us. And stop living for everybody else all the time. Do something for yourself. Because very commonly, women believe that to be seen as that perfect woman, you really have to be that uh, sacrificial lamb. I don't think that that should apply all the time. If I take myself, for example, yes, I have been the one sacrificing, uh, following my husband with family, bag, baggage and all from country to country. And I've changed countries 11 times in my career. And that is by choice, not because I was forced to. Because I, as a woman, I decided that for me, it is important to have a balance. And career alone and being in a boardroom alone wouldn't have made me that successful person. For me, I define success. Again, I don't define success for everyone on that same basis. For me, success is a balanced approach. So uh, when, I, when I followed my family around, I realized that it is important for me to then get back to the workforce if, for example, after every child, I quit my job. Not because I had enough money, but because that became my priority. I don't prescribe that as a recipe for everyone, but that, that was for me. But to get back to where I belong, what did I do? I engaged in higher education. So I think, A, women must make up their mind that they belong in the boardroom as well. B, they must equip themselves to be there. But lots of women give up after a child or two. They give up and they think that that's their job and that's how they're meant to be seen. So live for yourself as well, at least for a while. So Ruanti, what steps can organizations actually take to embrace both male and female workers, leaders, in equal measure, to have meritocracy in the organization? I would agree on the second point of meritocracy. But I do not think it's fair to define and prescribe that it should be equal numbers at any given time in a boardroom. I think because they are contradictory. Because if it's meritocracy, and if there are better women than men, they should be dominating, and vice versa. If the men are proving themselves better, why not uh, you know, have them on, on the, in the boardroom and not on equal numbers? Because that would be, again, discrimination. I wouldn't like women to be discriminated. At the same time, it is extremely important that we women do not discriminate men either. So uh, I think that uh, having um, strong rules and key performance indicators for measurement. Because it should not be on anyone's perception. Perception always can lead to you know, what you went through at home, what, how your mother behaved, how your father behaved, and therefore how you perceive other women to behave. That should not be the case. I think it's extremely important that in the workplace, people have clear responsibility areas defined and key performance indicators defined, which are measurable and which are doable. There's the UN's He For She campaign, initiatives that are using education to empower and enable uh, people around the world. Do you think education can be a positive force for change in realigning the leadership landscape? I would 100% support that. There is no other way. I know that in some industries, you do not need that paper qualification. I think again, like leadership, I would define education in a little different way. For me, education does not mean getting that certificate, going to that university or having multiple degrees. That is just giving you the background for education. Education is something that, again, you should use the paper or the, or the academic background that you have got as an enabler. Education for me is an enabler, but that uh, certification is an enabler, but education is something you have to acquire and work on. With that education, it is easier to prove a point. We women, fortunately or unfortunately, are in that special position where we have double standards thrust upon us. 
we sincerely do have that battle to run. And uh, if, for example, if you have a man who is supposedly doing well in office, is good looking, is successful, brings in a lot of business, both women and men would look up to that guy and uh, would say that he is a role model. But unfortunately, when a woman does the same thing, there is always the but factor coming in. And sadly, not only from the male species, also from the female species who are watching her. So I feel that the battle should also be within our own gender, so that our own gender bias is eradicated. So Ruanti, as a final question, what is your vision for the future of leadership in an organization? I think that both men and women should mature to get on to that next level of believing in themselves and in the others, irrespective of gender, race, nationality or religion. This is something that we are starving for. And that belief, I think, sadly, I don't see it happening in a year or two or even in the next five years or so. But I believe that women now are getting more and more assertive and more and more educated. And uh, the children, our, our children or the younger generations are being, beginning to realize that uh, people are taking advantage of this gender gap. Women take advantage of the so-called discrimination and men take advantage of the so-called men's superiority. And the younger generation are beginning to realize that this is only a myth and this is only an excuse to behave or misbehave. I learned so much from my two children. I've got a 30-year-old son and a 16-year-old daughter. I learn equally from both because that generation is more open, more exposed and more rational. So thank you very much, Ruanti. It's been great talking to you. Thank you, Savitri. It's been such a pleasure. Just as a footnote to end our discussion, Anna Maria Chavez, CEO of Girl Scouts USA, puts it as we've all heard the saying, you can't be what you can't see. And that might be the take home from this discussion we had with Dr. Duanta De Silva on leadership in a man's world. On the other side, Anushan Selvaraja elaborates on many current issues. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. Sri Lanka's number one leasing company is now the nation's largest and highest rated finance company with two international ratings. Let us move the nation as one with People's Leasing and Finance PLC. We can show you a world Shining, shimmering, splendid Amazing, beautiful, dazzling, wondrous space for you and me A whole new world The most advanced technology, now on multiple smart devices for total convenience. Welcome to h &B New World Banking.
Hello and welcome back to the show. I'm Anushin Selvaraja. We're now going to take a closer look at the latest business confidence index with the managing director of Nielsen, Shaheen Kader. Welcome back, Shaheen. Now, uh, the BCI is heading up again, but what are the sensitivities, uh, if you could go into detail, as to why this has gone up? Yeah. Well, the BCI has picked up a little bit. Uh, basically on the back of good performance in terms of business revenues in the last few months and also I think short term optimism in the in the future however in the medium term uh, there is some concern uh, sort of about the economy in the medium term what did respondents have to say about our economy in general and our business prospects the good news is that there is you know um, um, sort of more optimism because uh, the, the inflation is coming down so the concerns on Inflation are going down quite sharply, uh, and you know, as because mainly concerns are sp consumers are spending more, but actually also on the other hand, you know, this as I was saying, there is a concern that the economy would slow down. So this concern has uh, you know dampened the growth of the BCI somewhat. What about our investment climate, Shine? Well, Anushan, perceptions about the investment climate have been steady. I mean, since about February of this year. About 40% saying you know investment climate is good, and other 40% saying you know it's uh, uh, you know it's not great, but it's okay. Uh, but I think uh, what's happening now is that we see greater concerns on the global and business environment. Mainly, I because of the I think the concerns about the euro with the Greek default pend impending things like that you know are now starting to um, sort of uh, be thought of. So overall, what have you been able to glean from the survey? I think overall, Anushan, the business sector has taken a fairly long-term view because that's really why the index has picked up marginally. Uh, because of there's so much uncertainty right now with the political climate, and I think until the general elections are over and done with, uh, you know, we cannot sort of uh, see a sharp movement in the index. Thank you for joining us, Shaheen. That was the Managing Director of Nielsen, Shaheen Kader. After a short commercial break, we will be back with the latest on the economy. Stay tuned. When we entered the industry in 1995, a new star was born as a fully owned subsidiary of People's Bank. For those seeking to grow their businesses, PLC provided the seed. We are not only Sri Lanka's number one leasing company, but also the largest non-banking financial institution. Welcome to a new dawn for the nation. Introducing People's Leasing and Finance, PLC. We can show you a world Shining, shimmering, splendid Amazing, beautiful, dazzling, wondrous place for you and me A whole new world The future's got a whole new world for you The most advanced technology now on multiple smart devices for total convenience Welcome to HMB New World Banking Hello and welcome back to the show. I'm Anushan Selvaraja. We'll take a closer look now at the latest with our economy with economist and LNB columnist Deshal Timel. Welcome back, Deshal. Now, um, to start off with, what is restricting the Sri Lankan economy from being a progressive economy? It's a very broad question, Anushan. But if you look at right now, I think the biggest uh, impediment that we have is the lack of political direction and political certainty, which is, of course, leads into uh, economic policy uncertainty as well. Uh, and if you look at some of the if you look at the post-war era, post-2009, we saw a strong economic growth, uh, but that was really taking advantage of some of the low-hanging fruit. So that kind of um, peace dividend was, was going to happen regardless of, say, most lot of economic policy to an extent. Uh, but going forward, to continue that kind of momentum of seeing growth of 7% and above, you're going to need to see much more deeper structural economic reform. And these are in areas such as public uh, 
like uh, public services, uh, government, uh, government employment, agricultural policy, trade policy, and so uh, education, and so on. Now, these are much more politically contentious areas. Uh, a lot of these issues are things like, in terms of, say, subsidies, pension reform, uh, government uh, sector recruitment. All of these are very politically loaded issues. Um, and in a in the prevailing environment, I, it's very difficult to see any kind of uh, single political party having the uh, political capital to be able to implement some of these reforms because you could just imagine that if a contentious economic reform is uh, taken uh, taken on board it's very likely that you're going to see opposition coming in and therefore it's the the, the likelihood of that progressing is going to be quite limited so <laughs> right now um, the the real impediment is that lack of say political strength and uh, the political capital uh, that is required to make the tough economic reforms the, that we need. And I think that is the biggest short-term uh, short impediment that we have. Our external debt obligation, Desha, where do we stand? Um, so, uh, we've seen Sri Lanka's uh, accumulated public debt declining in the last uh, decade or so, from about 104% of GDP, now it's come down to about 78%. But what is um, interesting there is that there is about half of that is external debt. So that's debt we owe uh, overseas, usually in, in foreign currencies. Now, for local debt, you can always uh, you can always find a way of repaying it large. I mean, over the, over the years, you've seen through inflation, uh, you get a lot of um, a lot of debt can be repaid by gross nominal GDP growth. We can't do the same for external debt. So you need to have uh, basically an inflows of uh, foreign currency to be able to repay those things in the long run. Um, the other interesting difference that we have seen in, in recent years in terms of our external debt obligations is that in the past, if you look at say the night from the night from the post-independence era to um, the early 2000s, our debt was largely uh, by entities such as the World Bank, ADB, the government of Japan and so on. Uh, and most of those entities provide long-term financing and very low interest rates. So say 30, 40 year debt, 10 year grace period, 0 to 2 percent interest and so on. So it's very quite easy to manage that kind of debt. Since 2005, uh, since, since, sorry, since 2007, our external debt has largely been commercial borrowings. So those are much more shorter uh, repayment, requ repayment uh, windows and also at higher interest rates. So the management of that be becomes a lot more challenging. Now if you look at the, the immediate horizon over the next 12 months, uh, Sri Lanka has external debt obligations, uh, short-term debt obligations of around 4 billion US dollars. That's about 3 billion in terms of capital and 1 billion in terms of in, uh, interest. Now, the repayment of that we have been doing in recent years largely by by tapping bond markets, by then using it, using our inflows into say a sovereign bond to roll over our obligations. Um, going forward, that is going to be a little bit more challenging. You're seeing um, global markets tightening a little bit more. Um, and therefore, the, the cost of borrowing is probably going to be increasing as well. Uh, it's still not impossible to be able to uh, to be able to tap global markets in order to meet our external debt obligations, but it's going to be more challenging. Therefore, the longer term solution then is really how we manage our fiscal situation. We need to be much more prudent in the in our fiscal management. We need to curtail our recurrent expenditure in particular, so that we still keep space for the required capital expenditure levels. Um, and also enhance government revenue. Now, in the first quarter, we've seen that, uh, first four months, sorry, we've seen that revenue has grown by about 15% uh, compared to the previous year, largely, though, affected, driven by uh, imported products, so motor vehicle imports and so on, uh, and also some uh, some sin taxes, so on, alcohol and stuff. Um, but that is not probably going to be sustainable. We can't be, you know, relying on high imported motor vehicles all the time to drive our tax revenue. We need to have a much broader base of taxes and so on. Uh, through a, a, a better balance between particular income taxes and uh, indirect taxes. Uh, but right now, that we don't really see that happening. We're not seeing a broad basing of uh, our revenue as well. So those challenges make it, uh, make it difficult in order to see how we're going to kind of manage our external debt obligations in the longer term. Um, so right now, we're seeing a slightly challenging situation going forward on uh, external debt management. Thank you for joining us, Deshal. That was economist and LMD columnist Deshal Dimel. Thank you for watching Benchmark and we hope to see you again next time.